Alright, so now we're on to 11.7. Uh, in the last video we talked about or. Now we want to talk about and. And the idea of a conditional probability. Okay. So what we're going to do is find the probability of one event and a second event occurring. Notice the and is very different from the or. So now we're looking at two events, not the possibility of one or the other happening in a single event. And then we want to take that idea and extend it to conditional probabilities. And as you can see, they're very similar. Okay. So um, the and probabilities with independent events, much easier. Okay. With independent events, two events are independent if the occurrence of either of them has no effect on the probability of the other. This is like a little review. Okay. It's the, like the idea of mutually exclusive in our ORs. And probabilities with independent events mean that we are going to multiply them together. So with the AND, we're going to get a multiply together. Okay, remember the OR was an ADD, and so the AND is a multiply. So how are we going to do this? Okay, let's look at an example. Uh, a U.S. roulette wheel has 88, 38 sorry, numbered slots, 1 through 36. 0 and double zero. 18 are black, 18 are red, and 2 are green. The ball can land on any slot with equal probability. What is the probability of a red occurring on two consecutive plays? So what's the idea here? So the probability of a red occurring, and then I pick the ball up and I spin it again. The ball has no memory of what it did last time, so this is going to be an independent event, so I'm going to multiply the probability of another red coming up. All right. Now it does tell us that there are 18 reds out of 38 total, so I'm going to be able to multiply 18 over 38 by 18 over 38, um, and what you get if you plug that into your calculator is 81 over 361. And if you reduce that so it's a little bit easier to understand as a percent, maybe is like 0.224, okay? So you only got about a 1 in 4 chance of two reds coming up in a row. So I don't know, maybe a good strategy is to go red, black, red, black. And then, of course, you do have those two greens that are in there, and that means that the house always wins. Okay, that's the way the game is set up statistically. Okay, that the house always wins in the long term, and we're going to look at that in our next video. All right. Now, if two or more events are independent, we can find their probabilities of them all occurring by multiplying their probabilities. The probability of a baby girl is one half, so the probability of nine girls in a row is one half used as a factor nine times. Now what they're assuming here is that this is an independent event, but um, a as somebody who has four girls, I have four girls, okay, and my wife is pregnant, I really expecting another girl. And it has nothing to do with the fact that it's um, based on probability, is that our body chemistry really affects whether we're going to have a boy or a girl or not. So as long as you're not changing um, partners, uh, that you're having these children with, um, the fact is the body chemistry acts in such a way that these are not independent events. But now let's assume that they are, okay? <clears throat> so what's going to happen is the probability of a girl is uh, equal to one half. So the probability of a girl nine times, and I can actually use the ninth power for that, means that I'm going to have one half power raised nine times. Don't forget the parentheses, otherwise you'll have something very weird that could happen, okay? Um, and so this means that we're going to get a probability of about 1 in 512, okay? And again, this is assuming that there's independent events, but uh, the mom's body does remember what happened last time and is more likely to do that again. This is why you'll get 3, 4... Uh, five of the same sex in a row before you have one that, that breaks that. Um, and I'm thinking that probably age changes the hormones, and so it's the body chemistry thing that changes there that allows the, the opposite sex to creep in in a pregnancy. Okay? So, 
What about in example number three, hurricanes and probabilities? If the probability that South Florida will be hit by a hurricane in a single year is 5 out of 19, what is the probability that South Florida will be hit by a hurricane in three consecutive years? Uh, now, the idea here is that uh, we've looked at the number of years and the number of hurricanes, and we've come up with this number. I think this number is a little high, but we'll go with Blitzer's number. Okay, so the idea is that you can have the probability of a hurricane in a particular year times the probability of a hurricane in another year, and I can use multiply because certainly these are independent events. One hurricane does not know what path any other hurricane took or that there are even any other hurricanes that exist. And so each year I can multiply these um, probabilities together what will happen is uh, the probability of a hurricane in a particular year <clears throat> is going to be uh, 5 over 19 times 5 over 19 times 5 over 19, which is a really long way of saving 5 over 19 uh, cubed. And here, definitely, if you don't have the parentheses, something weird is going to happen. Uh, and you get 125 over 68.59 which is approximately a 0.018% chance, right? So you got about a 2% chance that you'd have a hurricane every year uh, using these numbers. Not a very good probability. That makes me very happy because I live in Central Florida where it's even less likely to get a hurricane, okay? <clears throat> now let's look at something just a little bit different. If a hurricane could hit with 5 out of 19, What's the probability that it will not hit in the next 10 years? Now, they have changed from 3 years to 10 years, but the principle is the same. So if you're looking at it, this is the probability of not a hurricane. And so that's the idea of 1 minus 5 over 19, which will give you 14 over 19. Okay, And so then the probability of not a hurricane in 10 years is going to give you 14 over 19 raised to the 10th power. Now, <clears throat> uh, it turns out that the uh, actual fraction is awful, awful, awful. So I'm just going to write the decimal, 0 .047. <clears throat> and what this means is that <clears throat> while you only have about a 2% chance of a hurricane every three years, uh, a hurricane every year for three years, that's a pretty rare event at 2%. The chances of going 10 years without a hurricane um, is only about 5%, so very low, okay? Uh, in Central Florida, that's not uh, true. It's it's much lower. Um, you know, we go years and years and years at a time without uh, having a hurricane come through, and certainly not a serious hurricane, okay? So... Uh, and probabilities with dependent events. Dependent events are two events or dependent events if the occurrence of one of them has an effect on the probability of the other. So we're getting close to conditional probabilities, all right? We're going to have to assume that something has happened. And probabilities with dependent events, um, the probability of A and B is given A, and P is B given that A has occurred, okay? And we're going to see this probability of B given that A has occurred when we look at our conditional probabilities. Alright? So, we have to assume, we have to assume A happened to calculate the rest of the probability. And it turns out that this is the right way to do it, okay? You do have to assume that A has happened to calculate the rest of the probability. And while some of us don't really like this word assume, <coughs> it turns out that this is the right way to do it. <coughs> Excuse me, and it comes out uh, in our theoretical and experimental physics. <coughs> probability, sorry, not physics. So let's say you've won a free trip to Madrid, and you can take two people with you, all expenses paid. The bad news, ten of your cousins have appeared out of nowhere and are begging you to take them with you. 
Alright, you write each cousin's name on a card, place that card in a hat, and select one name. Then you select the second name without replacing. The without replacing is really important, right? Because you're going to change the number of items from which you're going to draw from. This is going to be a common idea. If three of your ten cousins speak Spanish, find the probability of selecting two Spanish-speaking cousins. Alright, so how are we going to find the probability of finding two Spanish-speaking cousins? Well, you have the probability of a Spanish speaking cousin is going to be three of them speak Spanish out of ten okay now what's the probability of getting a Spanish speaker given that the first one was a Spanish speaker right well the idea here is is that you actually picked a Spanish speaker so instead of two Spanish speaking cousins left you only have three you only have two left and instead of having ten cousins left to pick from, you've already picked one of the Spanish speakers, so there's only nine left to choose from. So the idea is that when you multiply these probabilities together, three times ten, two times nine, you get uh, one fifteenth. Okay? So this is a pretty low odds. Alright? One in fifteen chance that both of the cousins that you pick are going to be Spanish speaking. So. What if I flip this around? What if I use a not? Okay, what if I just care that at least one is Spanish speaking? Right? This is a slightly different problem. Now here the idea, oh sorry, here the idea is if at least one is Spanish speaking, how do you calculate that? How do you calculate a conditional probability, right? Do you count up all the possibilities for for the first one being it and the second one being it and divide? I mean, this gets to be a really frustrating problem and steam starts to come out of my head and it's awful, right? But let's think about this. If at least one is Spanish speaking, the not of this is no Spanish speaking. That would be the not, that neither one of them speaks Spanish. And so what's the idea of no Spanish speaking? What's the probability of no Spanish speaking cousin the first time? Well that would be 7 out of 10 of them don't speak Spanish. And then the probability of no Spanish, given that there was no Spanish. Okay. Well, that means that there are still three Spanish speakers, so six out of the nine of them do not speak Spanish. Okay? So, because this is a not event, what you would do is you would say one minus the probability of no Spanish is going to give you the probability of at least one Spanish, right? Because if neither one of them are Spanish and you subtract that from one, the probability, that means the first one could be Spanish, the second one could be Spanish, or both of them could be Spanish. But at least one of them will be able to speak Spanish. And so the idea is you're going to have 1 minus 7 over 10 times 6 over 9 all right, and when you're 7 over 10 times 6 over 9, you're going to get about a point fifty eight, And so that means that at least one of them will be Spanish speaking about 60% of the time, which is pretty good odds. So maybe picking them at random isn't a bad idea. And this idea of being able to use the not so that I can get at least is a very helpful idea in probability. Okay? Now, what happens if you go to three events? Well, we're still multiplying, okay, with three events. So the idea is if three people are randomly selected, one person at a time, from five freshmen, two sophomores, and four juniors, by the way, the one person at a time means without replacement, find the probability that the first two people selected are freshmen. Well, you're going to have five out of five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, five out of eleven, for the for the freshman. And then let's say you've picked a freshman. We have to assume that we've picked a freshman. Now there's only four out of ten people that are left that are freshmen. And then the third is a junior. Now you're gonna have four out of nine left 
that are juniors that you can pick from. So this is the first one is a freshman out of 11. There are four freshmen left out of 10 people left. And then there are four juniors left out of nine people left. And when you multiply that all up together, um, you get 80 out of 990. And that becomes approximately 0 0.081. Okay? So this is the idea of those. Now this is very similarly related to conditional probability. Look, a conditional probability is B given that A has occurred. Well that's what we've been assuming, right? That A occurred, and so what's the probability of B? So we've really been doing this, and this makes us happy. All right. So we're just going to do basically one more example, but I'd like to do a theoretical example so that you can get a, a feel for this. Okay, so uh, you have a mammogram screening on 100,000 women in the U.S. ages 40 to 50, and these are the results. Now, assuming that these numbers are representative of all U.S. women ages 40 to 50, and given the large sample size it probably is, find the probability that a woman in this age range has a positive mammogram given that she does not have breast cancer. So you're looking for the probability of a positive on a mammogram given that no breast cancer has occurred. Okay? So the positive... So you're looking at this row column. I'm sorry. My dyslexia messes with my rows and columns too. So this column right here says that these, all of these women have no breast cancer, right? So the no breast cancer part is out of the 99,200. The total number of women with no breast cancer, right? So this is the given situation. And then they have a positive response. And so that's the 6,944 that have that positive result even though they don't have uh, breast cancer. And so this actually reduces to 7 over 100 which is 0 0.07, okay, or about 7%. So this is kind of scary, right? So if you don't have breast cancer, you could still get a false positive about 7% of the time, which is not real low, but this is why they go and send you for a second test, right? Because what happens is, uh, obviously, if you make the test uh, better at detecting breast cancer, um, then you're going to get a few more false positives. And this is basically what happens. Okay? Um, you get way more false positives uh, than you do um, uh, false negatives. Okay, right over here. False negatives. See the big difference in the numbers. Um, but that's so that you can catch everybody and get them treated, and then you can have a second one. I want you to keep the idea of this conditional probability, okay, and the fact that I use the edge of this table because this is going to become really important in our next chapter when we start talking about statistics. And that makes us happy. Okay.